I teach parents to surrender to the fact that now their life is no longer in their control. Any idea or delusion of control that they think they're going to have over this other human being needs to be destroyed so that you can truly enter the present moment and connect with your children as they need you to connect with them. One of the things that you teach is that we need to destroy our fantasies about parenting. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, I think we enter the parenting journey with these grand, mighty expectations and fantasies that we're going to have these little mini-me creatures who are going to follow what we say and we're going to create this picture-perfect family of success and bliss and those fantasies really then, when they don't come true, which is on day two, um, <laughs> and they come crashing, we begin to feel like we are failures, like there's something wrong with us. You know, so many mothers have told me how they couldn't breastfeed right away, or their baby wouldn't latch, or their baby was crying all the time, and the guilt sets in right away, or if you have postpartum depression. You know, or if you and your partner are not getting along on day three, you begin to have this panic attack because you had this vision. And whenever we preemptively have visions for anything, we set ourselves up for a possible disaster. Instead of living in the moment, right? Having a child is such an incredible journey, a constant adventure in the unknown. Mm -hmm. But if we are not ready to embrace the moment by moment utter unpredictability of this journey, especially till they are 16, 17, you just have no way of knowing how it's going to go the next day. And if you don't embrace and surrender to that utter unpredictability, you will suffer. Mm -hmm. You will suffer. And then when you suffer, you get triggered, and then your children suffer, and then the relationship suffers. So instead of setting ourselves up for these expectations, I teach parents to surrender preemptively to the fact that now their life is no longer in their control. Any idea or delusion of control that they think they're going to have over this other human being needs to be destroyed so that you can truly enter the present moment and connect with your children as they need you to connect to them, which is a moment by moment connection. Mm, yeah, and today more than ever, I would imagine this vision that we have of how parenting is supposed to be our relationships. Now there's so much comparison Yes. that's accessible as well. Oh my goodness. So, Just the other day I was with a mother and she said, you know, why can't I have five children like she does and have a career like she does and look so good like she does? So we're sitting here in our homes. Our toddlers have created a mess around us. There's vomit and bile on our, on our, on our beautiful hair. And we're feeling just completely, you know, fa like failures, hopeless. We're watching mothers going to the gym on their, you know, third week after giving birth. But we don't realize that that life that we're watching on social media are these little bits and pieces of a curated, produced life. It's not real life but we get swept away and we begin to feel bad about ourselves. Yeah. So this new book is titled The Parenting Map, Step-by-Step -Step Solutions to Consciously Create the Ultimate Parent-Child Relationship. And it's profound. What I've read so far is just mind-blowing. And I love the fact that you you poke the bear. I you do. Know? Like you <laughs> go in there and you challenge our beliefs about things and you're not shy about it. And we need that because, again, we're kind of living in this false perception of what life is in general, but also, of course, in the context of parenting. And if we're honest about it, just look at the results, right? Just look at the results of how things have unfolded. But in the book, you go through 20 steps yes. and you actually show us how to change our thinking to employ some of these things. And I would love to go through some of these steps. But first, I want to ask you, conscious parenting itself, what does that actually mean? Well, I stumbled upon it in my own parenting journey when I observed how unconscious I was being and I realized why I was being unconscious. And I was being unconscious because of this monster called the parental ego. And the parental ego comes 
because of the traditional parenting paradigm, which trains us parents to think that we are the almighty. We have supreme control. Our children should be seen, not heard. And we get to dictate our children's lives. So when we come from that mindset, every time our children then disobey us or what we think is disobeying us, it could just be that the child is expressing themselves. But you know how we parents are. We're like, you disrespected us. And the child is like, no, I just expressed myself we are set up to believe that that is defiance and that needs to be punished, that needs to be shamed. And then we go ahead and shame and punish our children, which then causes dysfunctional relationships and dysfunctional well-being in our children. So when I saw myself doing exactly that, you know, getting upset with my three-year-old and my two-year-old when she was two, when she was three, I realized, you know, I'm doing this because I am coming from the wrong paradigm. So I came across, you know, within my own awareness, a new paradigm. So conscious parenting is a revolutionary new paradigm of parenting where it's not about producing or cu curating or creating this perfect child, this model, but instead raising one's own self, the parent's own self, to a higher level of consciousness. So what does that mean in real life? That every moment with our children is a reflection for how we need to grow up. So if my toddler says, no, I'm not going to have the scrambled eggs, and I see my ego rising and wanting to say, hell yes, you will. I made the eggs and you will eat the eggs because I'm the parent and I'm the boss and I know better. Instead of that, I get to surrender the ego, I get to enter into the present moment and ask myself, why am I in this control mode? How can I watch what's coming up for me? And instead of feeling like it's personal, I can now drop that and relate to my child with empathy. So maybe the child does eat this, the scrambled eggs, but I don't have to yell at her or she can eat it in 15 minutes. Or So you create this flow with your child instead of creating this hierarchical rigidity with your child. Yeah, yeah, because I, I would imagine we're telling ourselves a certain story about why we're doing it. Yes. You know, we want to make sure that our kid is not hungry at school and all the things, but really, and you point this out repeatedly, it has something to do with our own ego about things. Yes. And the story we tell ourselves, like, they're disrespecting me. Right, right? That's, the, that's where things go awry. The yeah. story we tell ourselves when our children's expressions are not matching our fantasy, right? So it all comes with our expectations. When that clash occurs, that's where we get to see how wounded we really are because we will lose our shit. I mean, I've lost my shit on like nonsense. Like one time my daughter asked me to make um, some food. It's all, we're talking about food examples now, but it could be grades. It could be uh, an activity they enroll in and then they decide not to be part of. But I remember my daughter asked me to make her this acai bowl. So I went to the store, I bought the things, I made it for her. I was like thinking I'm gonna get an A++, best mom award. And instead she was, she looked at it, she you know, just fiddled with it with her fork and then she was like, no, this is not what I want. Mm. And she was just expressing herself, but I took it as, oh, you don't value me, I'm not worthy, I'm not important, you can just discard me. You know, I took it like some big, you know, relationship malfunction. Instead of, okay, you don't like it, well, you know, here are your choices, or now you need to eat it, or you can eat it later, or I just lost my flow because I got into ego. This is bringing up something really profound, which is these little people yes. have so much power over us, right. more so than a lot of adults even in our lives. And I think a part of it is because they're closer to honesty. Yes. You know, and so I if like a child that. says something to you, it's just like, what? Right. You know, it just hits you different. Well, if your child is empowered, like my daughter was, to just speak their mind, they're not trying to take care of your ego. They're not trying to take care of your wounded little child. They're just going to say no or yes. And they're not here to coddle you. But because we have been trained by the traditional paradigm that children should coddle us, actually the traditional parenting paradigm says children are here basically to take care of your ego parent. So by that traditional par paradigm, when a child doesn't care to take care of our ego, 
we take that to mean they are disrespectful, they are bratty, they are defiant, and we need to hunker down on them really with strong force and put them back in their place. What does that mean? That means our children are not allowed to be in that pure essence. They're not allowed to say what they feel if it's going to hurt mom or dad. And that's really dysfunctional. That's why we grow up to not know who we truly are and to suppress our feelings in relationships and get into dysfunctional relationships one after the other. Yeah, suppress our feelings, su suppress our voice. Yes, even yes. In, and it's in those moments. And again, we're doing this through the lens of like we're trying to help our child to fit into society and all these things. Right. And now, and also just a heads up for everybody, it's not that there isn't a context for, for all of this stuff. This actually leads right into step one. Yes. And this is focus on the right problem. Yes. So the traditional parenting paradigm has told us that the problem, if you have any problem in your parenting, it's the child's fault. So look for the fault and fix that problem. So I'm a therapist and parents will come with their little child, little Sarah or little Becky or little Johnny, and they'll drop him or her in my office. And I will literally have to say to them, you know, where are you going, mom? Or where are you going, dad? And they often say, oh, I'm going to go take a call in the car or I'm going to go get a Starbucks or I'm going to go get a Manny Petty. And I say to them, no, you're not. You need to be in my office and little Johnny or Sarah need to sit outside. And the parents are often flummoxed. They're just aghast by this because they think it's the kid who's the problem. Like, fix my kid. And my approach is, no, I cannot fix your kid until and unless I can, quote unquote, fix you. You are the one who holds the solution. And you are the one who has probably the problem because you're not seeing your children as they need to be seen. And this approach is not about coddling your children or indulging your children. It's about understanding what they need from you. Some children need a different kind of parent than the parent you can be. So you need to adapt to who your kid is, not the other way around. Yeah, that's so remarkable. It seems so obvious when you say it, Yeah, you know, that because we come into things with our certain template Yes. And really, nothing can prepare you for the the spirit or the personality of that child yes. when they arrive. Yes. Because each child is also very different. Right, but we don't want them to be different. We, we say it in lip service, but we really want them to be exactly like who we need them to be, a better version of ourselves. They can either be exactly like us or better than us, but they cannot be like our imperfect parts. If we see our imperfection in them, because we haven't accepted it in ourselves, we cannot accept it in our children. Just the other day, I was with a parent who, you know, really struggled in school and felt really inadequate all through his school years and felt like a failure and never really accepted that they were limited, you know? We cannot be good at everything. And uh, parents somehow think that our children need to be perfect at everything. A little bit of Julia Roberts, a little bit of Michael Phelps, a little bit of Yo-Yo Ma, a little bit of Einstein, a little bit of Obama, you know, a little rock star, a little M Mother Teresa. We have these idealistic impressions of who our children need to be, which is absolutely delusional. But it comes from our own idealized fantasies for who we should be we don't accept that we are limited you know I'll be the first person to tell you I'm limited in this in that and in, in the other I don't need to be a perfect superhuman therefore I don't need my child to be a super perfect human so that father who had not yet accepted that he was not a good student couldn't accept his child was also not really academic not every kid can be academic, athletic, dramatic, you know, you know, in every, in every field. What are we expecting from our children? And the reason we expect superhuman products in our children is because we have not yet accepted our own limitations. So whatever we have shoved aside in our own shadow and suppressed, we now cannot tolerate it if it shows up in our children. Like full force, we're going to, you know, push them to be anything other than who we denied in ourselves. 
But isn't it our job to make sure that they're the best that they can possibly be? Yeah, but who is the, everyone is being the best they can be. You know, this, this illusion, you know, this saying, uh, I just want my kid to live up to their potential, or I just want them to be the best they can be. Aren't we always doing the best we can do, like, in that moment? Like, are we purposely trying to not be the best? Like, right now. I think I'm doing the best I can do. But 10 years later, I could look at this interview and go, you know, what a dumb thing you said, Shifali. Like, why didn't you say it this way? Of course, because we're always growing. But in this moment, I'm doing the best I can. And every parent is doing the best they can and every kid is doing the best they can. Even if the parent is kind of maybe high on pot, okay, say. In that moment, that's the best they could do. We can only do the best we can with the consciousness we have in that moment. So there's no regret, no point looking back and going, oh my goodness, I was so awful five years ago or five hours ago because we are right here right now. So we have to always presume that people are doing their best. I always presume that our children are doing our best, their best in the moment. So when we say, oh, our kid did not do their best, according to whom? According to us, right? According to our standard. And that's not fair for our kid. I always presume my kid is doing the best they can. Yeah, according to our standards and our imperfections. Yes, exactly. You know, wow, that's so, so powerful, so true. So the question is, well, I, I think one of the insights would be to honor what is, you know, to see them as they are and yes. to appreciate that. Yes. And from that place, I think we can have a more healthful Yes. vision or articulation of what can what, what we can move to next correct so once you accept who it is your kid is in that moment now without resistance with embrace with celebration with honor you can create choices you're not just being triggered the thing the parent needs to ask when they are triggered is why am i being triggered right now most likely whatever failure has occurred has already occurred. Like the bad grade, already done. The drug issue, already in the body, right? Whatever we're getting angry with right now has already happened. So now what do we do? Do we keep, you know, admonishing our kid with shame or do we simply illuminate what they could do better and then move on? Let's move on, right? The bad thing has already happened. In every life, whatever we're afraid of has already happened. Otherwise, we wouldn't be afraid of it. So now what do we do? So do we want to teach our children the, the resilience of creating change? Or do we want to give them the shame of things that have, they cannot change? Is it shame for things they already have done and cannot change? Or is it resilience for things they now can change within themselves, right? Yeah. Oh, man. This is hidden. This is hidden. It's so powerful. So we're going to jump around a little bit with these sure. steps. You're already actually dabbling into yes. some of these steps, but I want to ask you about this one in particular <clears throat> because our society is structured in such a way that we hold up on a platform people who are successful yes, or people who have the appearance of happiness, mm -hmm. by the way, yes, which is often, very often not mm -hmm. true or mm -hmm. not consistent. But one of the steps is to end the chase for happiness and success. Yeah, I think that's the biggest one. <laughs> in our parenting mind and psyche, that we need to raise successful and happy children. Like at least bloody be happy, right? Like I'm doing all this for you, I'm sacrificing all this, can you at least be happy? So we get really tripped up on both these. So I'll just address each one separately. So the success one is exactly what you said. We have this defined fantasy around success and it's really to be rich. Right. Whenever I ask parents, I go, OK, what is success? Really? What is it? I go, is it, uh, you know, being a monk in the Philippines or being, you know, being a, an artist who's finding themselves on the streets of Bali? And they're like, no, that's not success. So when we really distill it down, it is just just be rich. Right? Please take care of yourself. Be wealthy. Live in the right zip code. Hang out with the right people. Have status and belong. And that's how society defines success, right? We, you and I know that. There's a traditional idea of success. And the illusion or delusion there is that that success means something and it has value. And parents will immediately then say, yeah, the value of that success is happiness. So we have somehow 
combined happiness with that very limited notion of success. And it is a lie. I am quote unquote successful, you're successful. Really the value in it doesn't come, happiness doesn't come from that. You know, the minute we reach one mountain, we're trying to get to the next mountain. And we don't want to pigeonhole our children into this narrow idea of success. And if we do, which we do, we will constantly butt heads against them. My daughter is not going to be traditionally successful. She is going to be successful in other ways. So if I, as a parent, keep trying to put her round hole into a, you know, whatever, it's square peg or whatever, into the whatever, into, I'm going to be constantly butting heads against her. So I made a decision early on to expand my idea of success. And in conscious parenting, I teach that success should be one thing only. Does the child honor their authentic essence, their idea of who it is they are, and flourish and make choices from that foundation? Not my idea of what success is, not what society's idea of what success is, but their idea. So my child, for example, if, if I saw that she wasn't very academic, I didn't push her in academics. I, I said to her, well, if this is not your strong suit or if not all academics are your strong suit, but you like English or you like history, focus on that. The rest just pass, you know, just get through it, but focus on what you love. So from a young age, I engendered in her this understanding that she must tap into what comes naturally to her, what is authentic to her, what is, what is something she naturally leans toward. So from a young age, she's honing that. Versus so many parents who take their kids down medicine or accounting or engineering. And then the kid at 45 realizes, oh, you know what? This is not who I am. So we want to match who the kid is with what they do versus telling them to match who they are into what they do. Right. But that takes work. Everything that takes, takes work. work. Yes. This but is our society is so it doesn't value that. Yes. It's structured in a way that doesn't value the yes. uniqueness of that person. Yes. And yes. as you said, like success, I think it's again under the guise of something positive, which yes. is we want our child to be successful so that they're not homeless. Yes. So still like driven by fear. It's all driven by fear and it's extreme fear. It's either or, you know, it's either or. The, the C grade means, oh my goodness, my kid is going to be a drug dealer. Like we go straight <laughs> to like crime, we go to prison, we yeah. go to homelessness, we go to preg early pregnancy. We go like, because I think, that our underlying fear is for all the things that we were afraid that we would end up as. You know, it's so ingrained in us that we those are the shadow elements of society. And I often tell my parents, okay, what if your kid does end up as a drug dealer or in jail? Can you completely control that outcome? You can't. So why are you living in fear of that ultimate outcome? If that happens, they learn from it. Right? I mean, are those people bad people? No, they're unfortunate people or they got caught up in circumstance. You cannot control every human your child encounters in college. You know, at the end of the day, after 16, 17, our control over our children incredibly diminishes, right? Like exponentially. So we cannot control every relationship with our children. All we can control is our relationship with them. That is the gold. And if we keep pounding into our children that they need to be something other than who it is they are, our children will soon not only lose respect for us, they will disconnect from us and they will not come to us. We will not be their safe harbor. I always tell parents, why do you want to ruin your relationship for something that could happen but may not happen in the future? Live in the present with your children and connect with them right now. And let's talk about happiness because our obsession with making our children happy has really not only over coddled our children and over indulged our children but we've also driven them crazy right they're not allowed to express their authentic feelings because we want them to be happy yeah. guess what humans are not designed to be happy with a smile on our face all the time that's unrealistic life is not about giving us pleasurable experiences all the time. In fact, we, you and I know, we only grow through pain. So by robbing our children of their natural, authentic pain, you don't want to give them artificial pain, but if a child, for example, comes home crying, they weren't invited to the popular kid's birthday party, 
That's an authentic real life experience. You cannot rob them from that. So if they're crying, it's okay for them to cry. It's authentic. But you spanking them is not authentic. That's you out of control. Now that's artificial pain that you're giving them. But when a child goes through authentic life experiences, such as breaking up or not liking their cellulite, okay? You don't have to go and rob them of that and suck the cellulite out of their body. Let them cry about it. It's okay. We're not meant to love every part of our body. We're not meant to not get broken up with. Every one of us has kind of experienced a breakup. It's part of normal life. So when we panic, it's because we feel like it's our responsibility to manage our children's moods, their feelings, their life experiences, their life outcomes. We cannot. We cannot take on that burden because through that burden, then we feel the pressure to make it happen. Then we lose our shit and then our kid feels really bad. You know, so we end up actually making our kid feel bad in our desire for them to be happy. And that's a vicious circle. Yes. It yes. sounds like. And even you just said it, you know, we learn, especially this species that we are right now, we learn so well through pain. Yes. And to try to rob our children of that or to avoid it, um, it it's obviously, again, it's, it's creating a society where our children are less resilient. Yes. And again, the data shows that. Just look at our society right now and in our pursuit of trying to make our children chronically happy yes they're more depressed than ever more anxiety yes higher rates of suicide all the thing everything is going up yes something is severely wrong yes well our generation or i will say my generation I, um you know created all these apps and all these luxuries for the children that now we tell we say are lazy now we say that they are indulged. But our generation created the Uber Eats and the Ubers and the, all these luxury, you know, tap on the screen and, you know, the genie will appear. And then we are yelling at our kids for being, you know, unmotivated and lazy and without ambition. Well, we took away pain. We took away their, their, the opportunity for them to learn to wait at a bus stop to wait for the car, to go to the restaurant, to have the restaurant be a special thing and not come into your house. Right now our children like are getting upset because the Uber Eats order is not correct or the Uber Eats driver is taking too long. And I look at my daughter and I go, are you serious? And she goes, I know, I know, I know. I didn't grow up in your time and I didn't grow up in India because I just want to like scream because our children have become so indulged, but they are responding to things that we gave them. We are giving them the cell phone. Then we're yelling at them for having the phone. We are on the phone all the time. So our generation needs to take responsibility. We parents need to take accountability for how we show up with our kids. Are we distracted? Are we suppressing our feelings? Are we eating too much and drinking too much and smoking too much and, and checking out too much? You know, all we have power over as parents is ourselves. And we need to take that seriously and then exempt ourselves from controlling our children's outcomes. We cannot control the outcomes of their life. We can only control how we show up with them. It is through our modeling that we can be present, that we can teach them, that we can show resilience, that we can you know, really teach them about not to be dependent on external validation. You know, How will they learn not to be dependent on the likes they get on Instagram or TikTok? if we ourselves are driven by external validation, yeah. right? Our children are watching how we dress up, how we get surgery, how we get, you know, how we treat our, our own bodies. They're watching us all the time. So it's one thing to talk about, you know, don't be dependent on your Instagram following or don't be dependent on what people say to you. Don't be bullied by the bully. But if we don't live that, right, day by day, then how will our children model that? Yeah, I, you just said model. Yeah. This is the model health show. Yeah, you know, and so that's a big, for me, just being able to 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 see examples of things has been the greatest teaching for yes. me. Rather than somebody telling me what to do. Yes. And so creating a platform where behavior can be modeled and yes. encouraging that in the person, mm -hmm. not us trying to force feed or distribute it exactly. to other people. You know, my son Jordan is here in the studio with us. I never told him yeah. to work in fitness. Right. You know, he's just in the environment. He sees yes. something modeled. 
Yes. And he found a love for it in his own perspective, his own way of yeah. it. And I can't force feed him to do things the way that I want to do things. Right. And also allowing him the space and opportunity to experiment, to make mistakes. Or to and, leave if that doesn't work out for him in a decade, yeah. he can leave. Right? So we have we only have influence. And influence only comes from connection. Now, the traditional parenting paradigm says we have control. And that's what I debunk in conscious parenting. We do not have control. We barely have control over our own lives, right? So the <laughs> only thing we can choose to have over these beautiful people we call our children is influence. But they will only be influenced by us if we choose to honor them, to connect with them, right? We cannot ramrod into them. We cannot, you know, walk all over them. We cannot shove things into them because eventually that will backfire. It doesn't have sustainability. Controlling another human being only works when they're very helpless, very young, very in your power, but it's not sustainable. Yeah. Eventually it'll backfire. Yeah, there's this interesting thing about humans. We don't we don't like to be told what to do. Yes, and that's know? a good thing. That and and we, we're going to eventually rebel. Yes, or, you know, in very repressive cultures, people may not rebel outwardly, but they will right. rebel inwardly. Yeah. So they will withdraw, they will get depressed, they will turn that anger and rage inward. They will eat too much, they will drink too much, they will suppress that rage in some way, and that is so unhealthy. Yeah. You said this term earlier, and I think it's one of the most important takeaways from today. And, you know, to see how everybody, every single human being who's ever existed or who ever will exist is completely unique. Mm -hmm. It's a completely unique phenomenon yeah. that's unfolding. It's a, it, and it's always in a process. Yes. How can we, you said this earlier, you said the essence mm -hmm. of the child. Mm -hmm. How can we start to cultivate an awareness or how can we see the mm -hmm. essence yeah. in our child? Well, if we're paying attention, every child comes with such a unique temperament. You see it with your children, one from the other, right? Each one comes with such a unique blueprint. But we have to pay attention. We have to really, our philosophy and our mission should be, I am not going to tamper with this essence. Sure, this essence needs to be guided and needs to grow and flourish, and we do live in this world with laws and rules. But for the most part, if my kid, for example, is a shy, dreamy, reclusive kid, I'm going to let them be that. I'm going to see the superpower in that. Or if I have a kid who's really like super, super boisterous and super hyperactive and super, you know, exploding all over the place, I'm going to see the superpower in that. I'm going to try to keep my kid as close to that essence as possible. You know, when my daughter was young, she wouldn't smile much, you know, and I think I smile like 24-7. So I thought my kid would be like me, a cheerful, optimistic, you know, easy breezy kind of kid. And she was like kind of tough. And I remember at her two-year-old birthday party, the photographer came to me and said, I'm so sorry, you know, I couldn't get her to smile. And I was offended. I was like, no, you go and try to make her smile. You stand on your head. You go get your clown suit. No, I didn't say all this. But in my <laughs> mind, I was like, you go do your job. But I was mortified, right? Mm, yeah. Because I wanted the smiling kid who was happy all the time. Because then I felt good about myself. I was successful. So I remember a whole dialogue in my head. And, and that's why I really had to change my whole paradigm. Because I realized, you know, in my kids' early years, that she wasn't the kid who was going to be a mini-me. And F it, if she doesn't smile, she doesn't smile. But I had to talk myself out of my ego and really ask myself, do you want to accept who this kid is? It's her birthday party, it's her face, and it's her mouth. She can choose to smile or not. But I had to really tame my ego because my ego said, Children should smile, she should be grateful, she should be cheerful, we've all made an effort to be here for her, how dare she not smile in a picture, right? So my mm. ego was going crazy. But that's how I began to cultivate this awareness that who it is they are is who they need to be naturally. You don't want to abduct your child from their spirit. So my child's spirit was a not smiling spirit. I'm like, okay, I got to accept, I got to celebrate, I got to honor who 
she is. And even today, you know, her emoji on the, my phone is a, a porcupine. because. But, but I love her for that, right? She's taught me so much. She tells me I'm the biggest pushover, right? She's a porcupine. Mm. We all have our essences, but there's a superpower in her being a porcupine. You know, she is who she is, and she doesn't back down. And I now see the value of that. Mm. And I teach parents, pay attention to who your child is authentically, organically is. Because the more you see the beauty of that, the less your kid has to wear masks to please you or to please the world. The fewer masks your kid wears, the more in their body they are, which means they're connected to their own self, which means they will not eat, use food to find connection. They will not use alcohol or drugs or dysfunctional relationships to find connection because they are already home. They are in their home. They're in their body. It may not look like the body you wanted, but it's their body. It's their temperament. They won't have to act out to get attention or praise or validation because they're getting it in their natural state. So you will save yourself a lot of years of therapy a lot of dysfunction if you simply tap in and tune in to who you are, right? It all comes from your honoring yourself and who your child's essence is. And in this book, I describe the main different types of essences. Is your kid like this or is your kid like that? So you can identify. Mm -hmm. We don't want to typecast anyone, but we, every kid kind of comes with a, te with a template. You know, this kid is like this, and oh, this kid was easy breezy right from the start. Oh, this kid, sh this kid was a firebrand right from the start. Parents will talk like that, but we can't use it as judgments. We need to use it as portals for celebration. You don't judge your kid. You celebrate who your kid is and find the superpower. That's the parent's obligation because the kid is ready to be who they are. They are happy. They didn't need to have a birthday party where you had a photographer. That was on you. So they they want to be themselves. But unfortunately, we pigeonhole them to be who society has trained us they should be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is so good. And the truth is, and you bring about this so clearly in the book, is that our children really are phenomenal teachers. Yes. And a lot of times they're teaching us through that timeless method which is through pain yes and giving us an opportunity to grow and to evolve and to be creative there's so much like juiciness and joy in it but we unconsciously i think we don't want to do the work yes and i, I just got the example when you were sharing that that my oldest son jordan we we find a lot of the same stuff funny yes right and so him and i'll be cracking up about something we'll look at my youngest son so jordan's 22 my youngest son is 11 and he'll be sitting there straight face. Yeah. It's like, what's wrong with this kid? Yeah. You know, what's wrong with you? Yeah. And so having this kind of difference in our sense of humors, for example, with my youngest son, what it's done is it allowed me to be creative in how to connect with him through yes. humor and to and to analyze and understand what makes what what's funny to him. Yes. Right? And it's it's broadened my palette. Exactly. So you had to expand. See, your first initial reaction was, hey, you better come on our team. But then you did it the other way. You're like, no, I need to go to his team. I need to go and understand who he is and find a way to connect. And through that, you grew, right? You had to learn other ways to find humor palatable or funny. Or You went to his team. And that's the mistake we make as parents. We want the kids to fit our model instead of crossing over the bridge to their model. And let me tell you that when you cross over the bridge and find beauty in who they are and connect with them and allow them to feel seen as they are, not so they please you, then that kid grows up feeling like they are worthy. You know, the, the number one plague of all eating disorders, all substance abuse addictions, is a sense of unworthiness. So where does that unworthiness begin to bear root? In the earliest relationships. So it starts mm. with the parent seeing the kid as worthy as they are, not putting on a mask, not being an achiever or a clown or a comedian or a pleaser. No, I see you. You are my teacher. Imagine if every kid grew up with a parent telling them, you're my teacher, I see you. 
And then also, I am your teacher. You know, we both are each other's teachers. What an amazing sense of inner worthiness that child will have versus how we are raising them, which is go to school, get straight A's, please me, do as I say, don't don't talk back, don't have an opinion. But then when you grow up, be a rebel, be a leader, be a, you know, a corporate, you know, superpower. But at home, do as I say. You know, it's ridiculous. We cannot raise children one way, but then expect them to grow up another way. Absolutely. And I think that our job, well, we think this kind of societal programming is that we are here to protect our child, save our child. Yeah. And you talk about this as one of the steps as well, to dump the savior complex. Yes, we cannot save our children from the world and their life experiences. We can barely, you know, they, you know, I have parents coming to me crying, oh, my kid rolled off the bed, or my kid hurt themselves, and I was right there, or at the, at the jungle gym in the park. And I always tell parents, well, this is life. What are we going to do? Now, I help parents through their guilt because they feel so bad, but we have this misplaced fantasy that we can save them from life's, you know, life's life, li lifehood. Life be lively. Life be lively, you know, and <laughs> life be life. We cannot. It's, there's no immunity out there in this world. So if you bring this kid into the world, you know, think hard before you bring the kid. But once the kid is here, they will meet the class bully. They probably will be called stupid, fat, or ugly at some point or in some version. They will not be invited to some party. They will have their heart broken. They will be fired from a job or not taken for a job. They may put on weight. They may have a problem with drugs. This is life. So you're not here to save them. And why is this important for parents to hear? Because in our fantasy of being the savior, we actually you know, yell at them too much, scream at them too much, and overprotect them too much. Versus connecting with them, teaching them, and guiding them, right? If this happens, then you could do this. But we cannot imagine every foreseeable future situation with our children. We need to go through life with them. The best thing we can tell them is no matter what, you have your own back. And as a backup to that, I got your back. That's the only thing we need to tell them is that no matter what, I got your back. But I cannot protect you from that situation occurring. You may get pulled over by the police. You may be racially discriminated against. But if that happens, and that may happen, I will have your back. But I cannot take away all racist people. I cannot take away all horrible relationships from your life. I cannot take away the, the nasty teacher who yells at you. I cannot. Right? It is going to happen. I love it. You started this off by saying immunity. Yeah. Right. And actually how we build up immunity is exposure. To exactly. Things, exactly. You know, but we don't think about that psychologically. We yes. just think about that in a very tangible yes. way. But it's even more true psychologically. Yes. And our minds are so powerful. Right. In being able to process and right. to essentially defend us Beautiful. rather than trying to kind of handicap our child or to be their savior, equipping them with a sense of self yes a sense of self-worth yes an ability to process things yes. and to understand other perspectives yes. absolutely more you know and we do it unconsciously we don't mean to protect our children to the point of coddling them but that's where awareness comes in we need to be aware of how life is teaching our children how to be resilient so when the teacher bullies your kid instead of going how did this happen how dare it happen my child is traumatized Teach your kid, wow, and you're standing here alive, and you're okay, and we can, we're talking about it, and we can go together and talk to the teacher. We show them that they are surviving. Every moment we show them, look, and nothing happened to you. You're fine. Mom still loves you, or dad still loves you. You're still okay. You love yourself. And we teach them moment by moment, not that things should not happen, but that when they happen, we're okay. So every opportunity can be transformed into gold, right? We're like alchemists. We need to teach our children to be alchemists with their lives, right? So, for example, when our kids are 15, 16, many parents have curfew, right? And I, I have a different opinion. I say don't have curfew, you know? Let other parents have curfew with their children, and then your kid will come home when, their kid, when the kids go home. Why not to have curfew? Because let the kid figure it out himself or herself that, you know, this is not good for me. I, I have a headache the next day. 
because they're going to go to college. And when they're in college, you don't have curfew, right? So by 15, 16, you want your kid to actually begin to experiment living on their own. But that's when parents become the most strict, you know, instead of preparing them and creating the leeway for your kid to mess up, to fail a grade or two, to wake up late or two, to, to see how it feels hungover or exhausted, because that's going to happen in college. Like it's coming around the bend, but when do we prepare them for that, right? Mm -hmm. So I never had curfew for my kid. Number, eight, number one, we never fought because there was no curfew. Number two, she learned, right? And whether she learned it well or not, that was up to her body to metabolize and learn. By giving artificial control over our children, we actually, as you said, don't build their resilience or immunity to figure things out on their own, right? All right. So this is, there's a resistance bubbling up oh. in me, you know, <laughs> because I would see this for, I'm just thinking through the, the eyes of other parents as well. Sure. It's such a culturally indoctrinated thing, you mm. know, it's for the safety of our, of our mm. children. And... This is what's so remarkable about your book is that it's providing us to start to see things through a different lens. And also that each child is unique. Yes. And how your parenting yes. needs to be unique as yes. well. And so there's a context for all of this, but the most important thing is for us to be open yes. to it. So even yes. if, as I feel a resistance yes. to a thing, just being open but here's to the seeing thing. things So let's just take the curfew resistance, right? Don't start out with a curfew. Start out with, let's see when they come home naturally. My kid never came home after midnight, ever, with full freedom to come home anytime. Kids are not stupid, right? But we so over-parent them that we actually begin to think that they cannot handle their lives. I'm talking 15, 16, right? If you have a really, you know, idiotic kid who will come home at five, then we have a problem, right? <laughs> but, yeah. by, but if you know your kid is wise, your kid's not an idiot. Your kid, by 15, 16, you've raised them, right? They're not suddenly going to become an idiot. And then if they are really testing the limits, then, like you said, okay, then we have a situation. But it's not a one-size-fits-all. Oh, 15 years old, need to have a curfew. Wait and see if we need to have a curfew. Maybe your kid is amazing and comes home on their own. So don't create artificial rules simply because that's the cookie-cutter way is what I'm saying. But here comes the place where again this takes work this takes awareness this yes. takes paying attention right and also you know one of the things that i i had to get to a place of true understanding about the world that we're existing in yes and we can't create a bubble like there's a do you do you know about the boy in the plastic bubble is like john travolta it's an old movie okay no, decades right, ago yeah. so it's this he's living inside of this bubble right, right? but in reality our children are going to be living in society, mm -hmm. whether we like it or not, whether yes. we appreciate how society is mm -hmm. constructed or not, mm -hmm. it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And one of the things right now, you know, the majority of our diet as a species here mm -hmm. in our society is ultra processed foods. Yes. So I know that this, this is the majority thing. Yes. So to try to shelter my child from that. Yeah. And to pretend like he's not going to be exposed to those things right. is really ignorant on my right. part. And so what I can do is we have a general culture within our family about right. what mm -hmm. foods we're eating mm -hmm. because it's just what we're doing. Yep. But also I'm aware and I've never told them don't eat that. Right. Right. If they're going to be at school and there's a birthday party. Right. You know, versus because there are parents and right. I've seen it. I might have participated in it, uh, you know, many years ago, but bringing their own cupcake. Right. 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 You know, this one is the gluten free, right. flavor free. Right. Sugar free, right. every free, right. invisible right. cupcake, and the right. other kids are having a regular cupcake. Right. Now, of course, they're dietary things, right. yes, but just in general, just because of living through our fear lens and not wanting our kid to participate in what society is doing and getting that feedback. Right. What if their diet is predominantly real food mm -hmm. and they have that thing? They're going to feel that thing. They're yeah. going to feel different. They might feel a way that they don't like, right. which is chances are this was going to happen right and i've seen my kids experience this and they right. self-adjust right because they know what it's like to feel good right. and having too much of this other stuff they right. don't feel good right right so we're not saying not to educate and not to keep enlightening our children 
Every day I send my daughter, when I eat really healthy, a picture of what I'm eating. That's all I do. She knows why I'm sending it, right? Just to show her, like, look, I feel so energetic because this is what I eat every day. And this is how mom looks because she eats like this. So I'm always subliminally trying to get her on the right path, but knowing that she can only arrive there when she's ready, right? Especially when they're growing up. Uh, you know, the, after that 15th year, you got to release your child to their own experimentation to what feels good for them and arrive at that on their own because that's sustainable, right? So we can expose, we can highlight, we can underscore, but we cannot force our children and we cannot guilt trip them with our love, right? We cannot take away our love if children do not do what we say we want them to do. So there's this additional step. And again, there's 20 steps in yes. the book. One of them is discover your two eyes. Oh, that's that's deep. Now you're getting a little deep. So Let's get deep. I okay. like it. I want to get deep. So there are three stages. Stage one is all about changing mindset. And we've been talking about that till now. Stage two is about breaking your dysfunctional patterns. So the two eyes refer to your inner child and your imposter ego. Each one of us, if we're just talking about ourselves as psychological beings, right? There's no real inner child living inside us. It's a psychological entity. We developed an inner child which lives in fear, which needs love, which needs approval, worth. If the inner child could talk, it would say, am I worthy? Do you see me? Do you love me? Do I belong? That's the, the cry of the inner child. Most of us developed an inner child because we weren't seen enough by our parents. We didn't feel valid enough. We didn't feel approved enough. So we have this hunger inside us. And in psychological terms, I call it the inner child. And because that inner child didn't get the love it needed or the worth it needed, it got it through a proxy, a surrogate self. And the surrogate self is the false self, the mask we wear that I call the imposter ego. We're all walking around as imposter selves, not our authentic selves, because we're all trying to get the love and validation we need. But we think we can only get it through this imposter self. So for example, my imposter ego is the good girl. I used to be the super good girl, super achiever. Many girls grew up like that and rescued everybody, fixed everybody's problems because I got a lot of validation for that. But now as an adult, it sabotages me. It messes me up. People have taken advantage of me. I've been stolen from. I've been, you know, lied to. And all because I wanted to be good versus be real. Like if I was in my real badass self, I would be like, no, I would catch the people lying and cheating. But because I was so in my pleasing self, I shot myself in the foot. So our inner child creates these false selves that work in childhood. They get us to survive childhood. The teacher likes us, the parent likes us, okay. Or we become rebels, or we become comedians, or we become super achievers, some, some version of some false self. We're afraid to be our true selves. But then when we grow up, it kind of burns us out. We get into trouble, you know? It gets us into some sort of trouble, and that's our awakening, our opportunity to awaken. And then I talk about the third eye in the book. It's called activate your third eye, like the third eye, which is your insightful self, your adult self. And that's really the journey of awakening, to realize you have an inner child, to see how you've compensated for the inner child by creating this imposter ego, and then awakening to your insightful self or your adult self. So stage two of this book, The Parenting Map, is really every human's route and road to awakening. Yeah. And this is so wonderful because we don't devalue that you're the good girl. Yeah. Right. That person doesn't just um, have not have value, but without you going through those things to kind of recalibrate yes. and to develop intelligence mm -hmm. with it, mm -hmm. because your ability to, you know, to, to inspire others, to serve, to teach all those things are valuable but it's being intelligent in where you're putting it yes. versus just spraying it out to everybody. Correct. You have to have you have to have the compassion like uh, the, like the good girl has or whatever our good part has, but we have to have wisdom too. Yes. We have to have discernment. We have to now have the masculine with the feminine, right? So in all people, some people have the over masculine side developed in their ego mask and then they have to develop the feminine. So we're always becoming aware of how we overcompensated 
it's an overcompensation. Yeah. Like I naturally am a pleasing person, but I overcompensated by being this uber good girl to the point of self-sacrifice. So that's not healthy. So it's the overcompensation, the thirst, the need to get validation. You know, a, a, a substance abuse addict has an overcompensated desire to get validation. They just do it by you know, sabotaging themselves, by drowning themselves, because they're so afraid to be their real selves. So we're all trying to be seen. We've just developed these really dysfunctional ways of being seen, you know? I mean, if you look at social media, all these hyper-realized, hyper-sexualized images, everyone's in the image of themselves. And spiritual awakening is about burning, destroying the image version of ourselves and entering the absolute, ordinary, authentic, natural self. No image, no image. Showing up without the image. How hard is that? So right? Today, especially, oh my goodness. But, but we're yeah. parenting our children from our image. Yeah. So we're making them into an image too. So we're dissociating our children from their authentic self. So our children have an image now. So in this book, I talk about recognizing your ego self, but hell, now you have to recognize your kid's ego self. So when your kid is banging the door and screaming at you, now they are in their fighter ego self. And it, the, the beauty of this book is when you recognize your own ego, then you see your kid in their ego. And instead of yelling at your kid when they are in ego, now you have compassion and you go, wow. I have done that, I've triggered my kid, now they're an ego. So how amazing that you then get to see your kid's ego and instead of yelling at your kid's ego or changing your kid's ego, you now begin to help your kid to heal what their inner child wanted in the first place. So it's a transformational model of healing. You talk about this as well, breaking these dysfunctional loops. Yes, is yes. Is a part of the process. But by the way, have you seen a tendency of people swing like the pendulum swinging to the other side like going from good girl going bad yeah because right? you're, you're you're so you're in reaction not in healing but i think every good girl needs to go bad for a little bit to then yeah. come back to center that's our tendency right where we burn the house down we're like yeah. that's it i'm done and we want to destroy that but here's the thing that's never going to be the right way either because the answer is not to burn the good girl but to see the beauty of how the good girl was in pain, right? Or how the bad boy or the bad girl was in pain, whatever version you are being, to recognize the pain beneath the ego, to heal the pain. Swinging in behavior is just superficial, you know, trying out a new mask. That's not going to work. You have to heal the pain. Like, why do I feel the need to be seen as worthy by others? Yeah. That's the pain we're walking around with. Please see me. Please tell me I'm worthy. That's what social media is all about. See me, see me, see me. Like me, love me, right? If we don't heal that wound that's underneath, who cares if you're being the good girl or the bad boy or the bad girl? It's the wound that you have to heal so that you release the need for the mask in the first place. Again, I'm good. I'll say this one more time. This is gonna take work. It's gonna take awareness. Part of the reason I think this is more difficult today is that we're, we're so kind of inundated and conditioned to do less you know where you mentioned it earlier the creation of these apps and things like and so we all feel very tired and lazy there's like this kind of there's this mist of it in our society today even a, even a, even having the energy to think <laughs> or right? to read right you and i were talking about how reading is a lost art yeah people yeah. are not watching long videos they're not reading because they're not connected to themselves, they want to be in a world of distraction. So we it's are, easier. It's much easier to dissociate, to check out. So that inner connection is being lost. So yes, it takes work, but let me tell you, the other part, the other alternative of this abyss of checking out, eventually is going to lead to more severe mental illness and then it's going to be more work in the long run. Yeah. So yes, you're sitting on your ass and scrolling on social media. You appear to not be doing work, but the toll that's taking on your mental health is so enormous that it's almost scary to think about. It is 
we, but we are seeing the effects of suicide in teenagers and young adults at an all-time high. We're seeing young girls, you know, as young as 12 and 13, doing a lot of self-loathing behaviors, self-harming behaviors. We're seeing boys isolating themselves, playing aggressive, violent video games more and more. In Japan, the phenomenon is called hakikomori. Over a million, maybe a million point five, young teenage boys are locked up, isolated, playing video games. You cannot get them off their video games. So this is a rising trend. So it looks like less work. Oh, wow, everyone's chilling. Oh, no. There is a lot of destruction happening at the emotional and psychological level. Yeah, because this, it is easier to, to go to those things, but it's not fulfilling. You know, it's different. It might be, again, like a temporary feeling of like, pleasure yes but we start to dig such a deep hole right and a gap in our actual fulfillment and right. sense of value and connection to reality right. it's like food you can go to the fast food joint pick up a burger for a dollar you get the instant hit the instant food but and and chopping up a salad is a lot of work right but in the long run what's going to be better for you and for your mood for your your energy levels what's going to be better right I just want to talk a little bit about stage three. Okay. And again, everybody needs to pick up a copy of this book. Please get this book. It's so important. This is something that I'm very, very passionate about. And I've been I've been weaving it in to the Model Health Show for years because I think that part of our kind of healthful evolution as a, as a people, as a society, is creating conditions where we have healthier, more well-adjusted, self-valuing children mm -hmm. you know and it's really it's such a opportunity that we have mm -hmm. right now we have such a gift in front of us that again you can displace it right and that it is you know right. it, it's it's okay but if we really want to see change you know and in the visions that we carry it's just about allowing people to be healthy and mm -hmm. happy and and well adjusted right. within themselves within themselves and so in stage three you kind of dig in more and you talk about learning kid psych mm -hmm. is one of the things that really jumped out at me and also mastering kids speak. Right. Let's talk a little bit about that. So kid psych is related to what we talked about, understanding that every child comes with their own essence. And I talk about the different types of kids you could have. You could have a hyperactive exploder. You could have uh, an explorer kind of kid. You could have a dreamer kid. You could have a recluse kid. What, what is your kid's natural temperament? And how can you as a parent allow them to feel okay? It's okay if you're shy. It's okay if you can't sit in a chair. I, I get you. I understand you. I see you. You don't have to feel bad about this. You don't have to feel ashamed about this. And in fact, this is the way your temperament is your superpower. Imagine being told that as a kid. Like, I'm shy. Like, I don't, I don't need to go to every party because my mom told me it's my superpower, right? A, a five-year-old saying, I don't need to, you know, be the extrovert. I'm the introvert. Imagine being told as an introvert that that's a superpower because the whole culture says, no, you have to be an extrovert. And the extrovert, great, that's a superpower too. But, you know, we tend to pigeonhole our children, as we've talked about, and only celebrate and applaud things that society likes, loud kids, achieving kids, competitive kids. You know, my kid hated competitions. I had to learn to see that as a superpower. She doesn't need to go and show off. Wow, that's a superpower. She doesn't need the medals. That's a superpower. But my old self, my ego self said, no, you need to be a competitive kid. It's a competitive world. That's a lie. So that's what mastering kids speak is and uh, kids psych is and then kids speak. Children speak in completely unique ways. They don't have logical articulation like we do because their brain is not yet developed. So if we don't understand what children are communicating to us, we will miss the point. Kids speak to us about their feelings through their behavior. So behavior is a flag or a signal to their feelings. So I often say that when you don't like a kid's behavior, take it like a sign. I use the acronym S-I-G-N for something inside gone negative. So if you don't like the behavior, don't pounce on the behavior. That's your kid's way of communicating that something inside has gone negative, right? That something they're feeling 
has gone messed up. So when they're slamming the door and saying, I hate you, mom, it's so easy to get triggered and take it personally, as if the kid really hates you, right? I remember once my kid said, I hate you. And I got, you know, emotional later. And I said, you really, you really hate me? And she was like, when did I say that? I said, are you kidding me? You yelled at me. The door flew off its hinges. And you said you hated me. And she's like, mom, I was just tired. And I said, I hate it. I said, no, you said you. She said, no, I said it. But that taught me a big lesson that, oh, here I only care about my ego. Do you love me? Right? We only want to know, do you love me? Am I doing well as a parent? But kids are not here to make you feel valid. Your kid is not here to do the work your parents did not do for you. Your kids are not here to reparent you. You have to reparent yourself. So when your kid is having a messed up mood, and they can be messed up, okay? Kids can be really obnoxious. If you can just remember that it's not about you. The last thing on your kid's mind is you. They are either protesting something you're saying because they hate it, like my kid said to me, or they're having a hard time with themselves and their own reality, and you are their safe space. So if you just allow them to dump in the safe space, but you just exit or you just take it, you know, not personally, you depersonalize it, you detach, you really then, when the storm is over, can come back and connect with them. So behavior is a flag or a signal to their inner feelings. Don't take it personally. Master what that could mean. Ask them what, or ask yourself, wow, what could that mean about how my kid is feeling about themselves? And don't get entangled in the web. You know, so these are some of the tips I give in, in this section of the book. So the third section of the book is about creating conscious connection. And I give real serious strategies about how to empathize, how to validate, how to listen, how to attune. Uh, you know, attunement is a big part of conscious parenting. And I use the acronym WARM, W-A-R-M. I fill it up with acronyms just to make it easy. But W-A-R-M stands for witness witness, observe. A stands for accept who your kid is or what they're doing right now. Respect that they are coming from an honest place. You know, trust your kid and then mirror back. Oh, I see that you're going through a hard time or what I see is that you're struggling. Instead of all the other things we do, we do through blind reaction. Yeah. Well, the final thing would be, you know, there's obviously so many stages and places on the journey of parenthood yes and a natural thing can come up when we find out information like this and we start to see things through a different lens like it's too late like this phase has already happened things are in a certain way they're setting these certain patterns these certain loops dysfunctional loops it's too late for me right my child is five now i should have started when i was they were two my child is 10 now i should have started right. when they were you also have this portion of the book which is to start right now Yes, that is the most important principle of life, right? The most powerful way to live is here right now, right? With every diet that failed yesterday, you start again right now with this glass of water, with this moment in time, with this plate of food. The same with our children. Every kid, even if they're in their 50s, deserves a parent who sees them. And when my mother, and she's in her late 70s, when she doesn't see me now, it upsets me, right? So every moment, no matter how old your kid is, our kids are always going to be our kids. So every opportunity that you can use to arrive at a higher state of consciousness, isn't that amazing and powerful? There is no such thing as it's too late. It's right now, if you're alive and you're breathing, this book, The Parenting Map, is a design for every human to clean up their emotional baggage from childhood and become conscious human beings. Really, this is a self-help book for every human who wants to be more conscious. Yeah, and you've done such a wonderful job at this and I appreciate it truly. This has been just wonderful going through everything and you know, kind of digging into my own biases and, and questioning things, but most importantly, getting tools, like how to actually put things into place and I appreciate it so much. Can you let everybody know where to pick up the book and yes. where they can get more information? Yes. So the book, can we hold it up? Or? Of course. Yes. yes, absolutely. So it's called The Parenting Map, Step-by-Step uh, -step Solutions to Consciously Create the Ultimate Parent-Child Relationship. 
and it's really it's full of illustrations look at look at how many illustrations here really to show it in clean clear terms i have practice exercises so they can go to my website dr for doctor just like this dr shifali.com i'm also doing a free summit later this month with 30 plus experts so they can join that free parenting summit and learn because it's never too late to give our children the best of our consciousness. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. So there's different types of intelligences, different types of learning, but when you have a school system that has reduced learning and teaching down to only one type, you dismiss and you don't pull the gifts out of the children 